uh, I'm trying to work in as many damn puns, and I was going to say damn it, but I won't do it. Um, we'll pull the group together. I would love to just say thank you so much for joining us today for our, our briefing. Good afternoon to everyone. Welcome to Dams in Every District, Challenges, Opportunities, and What's Ahead. Um, and I would like to start first and foremost by thanking our good friends at American Rivers for helping make this briefing possible with their partnership. It's been a great process pulling everyone together today to learn about these issues. Uh, and I would like to say thanks to Representative Ann Custer and her great staff for helping us with the, excuse me, with the room today. Um, but I would also like to thank her for her presence today. Uh, and uh, we are going to um, hear some welcome remarks, some introductory remarks from Representative Custer in just a moment. Um, you serve the second district of New Hampshire, and you were born and raised in Concord, New Hampshire. I was born and raised on the other side of the river in Vermont, central Vermont. Um, and you were elected to Congress in 2012. Representative Custer is a member of the House Energy and Commerce Committee, where she serves on the Health Subcommittee, Energy Subcommittee, and the Oversight and Investigation Subcommittee. She's also one of the, uh, also the chair of the New Democrat Coalition, a group of nearly 100 common sense Democrats working to break through the partisan gridlock and get things done for the American people. Uh, you are here today because you're a great leader on these issues, uh, and I just want to say thank you so much for joining us. I'll invite you to the lectern, and uh, really looking forward to your remarks. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. If I close that, will that end? I'd... No, I just don't want you to lose it. I mean, if I close it, will it end? Are you sure? No. <laughs> okay. Ah, sorry. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome. Delighted to be with you. I'm Congresswoman Annie Custer from New Hampshire, 2nd District, the left side of the state. And um, thank you to the Environmental Policy Study Institute and uh, to my good friend Tom Kiernan from American Rivers for hosting today's event. I also want to welcome the rest of our guests and our distinguished panel, uh, particularly my uncommon dialogue collaborator, Malcolm Wolf. And You'll probably hear quite a bit about the Uncommon Dialogue today, um, but this was a way of bringing disparate interests together, um, and we call it a damn good idea. Um, so we tried to put that in a bill title when we came up with the bill, and uh, we were stopped by a senior statement statesman in the Senate who did not believe in profanity and bill titles. I said, no, D-A-M. But um, anyway, that didn't fly. So happy to be with you to talk about one of my top priorities. And I want to thank my legislative director, Will Pisano, who's with us, who got so involved in the dam uh, issue and hydro energy in our office that he ended up um, leaving me for a period of time to go work for the hydro association, and then we stole him back, and he's now my late LD, but thank you. So let's not mince words. New Hampshire, like many of your states, has a big dam problem. There are more than 4,000 dams in our little state, and the average dam in New Hampshire is nearly 100 years old. So this is an ancient technology that has been very helpful um, for energy, for years and years and years, this uh, was how we powered our textile industry, uh, making flour, making all kinds of things, clothing and shoes um, and wood products. Uh, also protecting our state from flooding. We have a lot of dams that came out of the 1938 uh, hurricane and FEMA and lots of dam projects that protected um, our cities and towns and quality of life. And uh, for river conservation, we have um, dams that create a wonderful um, kayaking when they're, when they're uh, let out at certain times and um, wildlife and lots of things. So we knew um, in this uncommon dialogue that there were many positive attributes, but we also knew that we were talking about aging infrastructure. And with our focus on clean energy, we knew that hydro had a lot to offer. So let's you know, kind of come together and talk about the win-win-win scenario and see if we couldn't get people with disparate interests talking about that outcome. So um, this all started a, a classmate of mine from college, Dan Riker, 
was the person who first approached me about this. And then when he told me Tom was on, involved, and then I met Malcolm, and um, I became very, very interested, along with others. My colleague Peter Welch, now in the Senate, um, Shelley Pingree's very interested and involved. Just had a long conversation with Becca Ballant to get her involved with this. And, um, and then people all over the country. Uh, R's and D's, Kathy McMorris Rogers and I are working on um, the hydro legislation in the House Energy and Commerce Committee. So there's a lot of common ground to be had across the aisle in different regions of the country. But in Congress, I have been very proud to champion what we call the three R's that came out of this uncommon dialogue. Removing dams that have outlived their usefulness, rehabilitating unsafe dams that can still serve a useful process, purpose. And part of this is a safety issue. In many of your states, you may have dams. We've heard some horrifying stories. There are other horrifying stories that are waiting to be told if we don't take action soon. And then um, my favorite, retrofitting dams to increase hydropower production and um, to create more clean energy at a time when we know we need energy. Um, but to me, hydro not only is a great source of clean energy, it's a fabulous source um, for um, what you would think of as battery storage. It's actually natural hydro storage that you can hold water back in a big lake up above your dam, and you can choose based upon when the power is needed, when to let the water out downstream. And so this is something that's already practiced in my part of the world on the Connecticut River. We have a whole series of dams between New Hampshire and, and Vermont, and we're using this natural storage. In Europe, they do it purposely. They build things that way where they, I've seen a, a facility in Austria where they are literally pumping the water up and storing it and then bringing it back down. And so this is something that is a whole different dimension to hydropower and dams in the evolving ecosystem of clean energy. Removing dams is a common sense approach to improving dam safety at abs obsolete and inefficient dams. As I mentioned, this average age of almost 100 years. This is especially true in New England where dams were built on mills that have operated literally for decades. Removing dams that have outlived their purpose can also improve river health and ecology. And I'm sure Tom will speak to that. Rehabilitating dams is also critically important. And across our country, as I mentioned, dams facilitate agriculture, transportation, water storage, and recreation. Rehabilitating these facilities ensures communities can continue to enjoy these many benefits and also is a safety um, consideration. And finally, as I discussed, retrofitting dams can help us increase hydropower production uh, can help us create this natural battery storage for using the energy when we need it and can set us on the path to meeting our clean energy goals. So I'm delighted to be with you. I apologize that I can't um, stay. If I wasn't uh, headed to a meeting with our leader, I would <laughs> be more relaxed about staying, but I'm due in um, Leader Jeffrey's office in five minutes. So thank you very much. You, uh, great to be with you. Thank you. And um, great. Let's see. All right. We'll make sure the laptop is working. Thank you, Representative Custer, as you're walking away for joining us today. It means a lot that you um, took time out of your busy day to join us uh, to help introduce this very important topic and this very important briefing. Um, and uh, I mean. Hakeem Jeffries is a pretty good reason to leave, but um, uh, I know I've been learning a lot about dam removal lately, and so I'm really eager for the rest of the show. But first, let me introduce uh, the Environmental Energy Study Institute for the uninitiated. Uh, believe it or not, we're celebrating our 40th year in 2024, uh, and we've been, uh, since 1984, we've been providing policymaker educational resources uh, to members of Congress and their staff. 
uh, about environmental energy and climate change topics. Uh, what does that look like? It looks a lot like this. Uh, we do a lot of Capitol Hill briefings. We do about two dozen a year uh, where we bring in panels of experts and leaders and practitioners to talk about solutions, to talk about challenges, to talk about opportunities. Uh, and our briefings cover a wide range of topics. Today, we're going to be talking about dams in every district. But uh, our first briefing of the year, for example, was about the Fifth National Climate Assessment. We did a briefing a couple weeks ago with our friends at World Resources Institute. You want to do it? You want to put it back? OK. Um, I thought you were like poised. Um, about ocean carbon dioxide removal. And we will be back up uh, in a few weeks to talk about what's happening in small and medium-sized cities when it comes to nature-based solutions, uh, which is another topic. So we cover a lot of ground. We also do briefings about the Inflation Reduction Act and the Infrastructure Investment Jobs Act. But we always want them to be timely, accessible, relevant, and practical. Uh, talked a lot about briefings, but we also do fact sheets. There's a really great climate jobs fact sheet on the front table. If you haven't taken a look at that, it's really, really great. And even includes uh, an overview of not just jobs on the mitigation side of things, but on the adaptation side of things, which is something that our fact sheets have been doing more of um, lately. Um, we uh, also do a lot of article writing. We have a podcast. You might be thinking, well, that's way too much for me to remember. How could I possibly keep up? with the tremendously robust educational programming that EESI provides to policymakers and the public. Well, we have a bi-weekly newsletter called Climate Change Solutions. And if you haven't already subscribed to that, I really encourage you to do that. It's a great way to stay in the loop. Uh, and like today's briefing, everything else, you can visit us online at www.eesi.org and access everything. But today, our topic is the state of dam infrastructure across the United States. There are more than 500,000 dams out there, and they come in all shapes and sizes. Uh, and they were originally built to serve a wide variety of purposes. Some of them were built to power factories. Uh, some of them are involved in irrigating crops. Some of them generate electricity. The Army Corps of Engineers maintains a national inventory of dams. And of the 92,000-ish dams uh, listed, about 85% have outlived their expected lifespan. That is a damn shame. And as you can imagine, it presents challenges for the owners of the facilities, cities and towns, states, the federal government, and importantly, industry, as they seek to ensure the safety of the public and the health of the environment. We have a top-notch panel today uh, to uh, help us discuss these options uh, available to dam owners, including dam removal. Before I introduce my panel, uh, I'd like to acknowledge something. As you may have noticed, we have an all-male panel today. We were uh, very happy to welcome Representative Custer, uh, who is a, a woman and a leader on the issue. But um, unfortunately, we're all guys uh, up here today. Uh, it's something that we are very conscious of. Um, we do our best to ensure that we have diverse and re representative pace, uh, panels. I think it's been about four and a half years since we've had an all-male panel on Capitol Hill. So we generally do a really great job. Um, the women in leadership positions that were invited to speak today were unfortunately all unavailable. Uh, and we want to acknowledge that the field of conservation, and in particular dam removal, is largely driven by women. And we appreciate the work um, that they have contributed to this field. And we look forward to future panels where the workforce is better represented. So uh, with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Tom Kiernan. Uh, Tom, it, oh, actually, one more thing. Questions. We have 10 pounds of flour in a five pound bag today. We have a lot to get through, but we will do our best to have time for questions. We'll have questions in the room. We'll have a roving microphone. If you're in our online audience, you can send us an email. And the email address to use is ask, A-S-K, at EESI.org. Also, please follow us on social media at EESI online and keep track of it that way. Sorry, Tom. Now I'll introduce you. Tom Kiernan is the president and CEO of American Rivers. Throughout his career, Tom has been dedicated to protecting the nation's lands and waters, diversifying the conservation movement, and advancing innovative solutions to benefit people and nature. Before joining American Rivers, Tom led the American Wind Energy Association for over seven years and is president of the National Parks Conservation Association from 1998 through 2013. He and his team established the Community Partners Program, one of the first diversity programs of any major conservation organization. Tom, you and your team have been great partners with today's briefing. I'm really looking forward to your remarks. Thanks for being here. Great. All righty. Thank you very much, Dan. Let's get the... 
Setups, wonderful to be here. Thank you all for being here in the room and online. Uh, Tom Kiernan with American Rivers. A few words about American Rivers. We've been um, around for over 50 years uh, protecting healthy rivers, often they're kind of often wilderness areas, restoring damaged rivers throughout the country, and also conserving clean water. Um, Congresswoman Custer made a reference. Let me, there we go. Uh, Congresswoman Custer made a reference to the Uncommon Dialogue, and I just want to frame that out a little bit more because you will hear references. This has been an effort for, give or take, five years of the conservation community, I think fairly uh, led by American Rivers, but with great colleagues, Trout Unlimited, TNC, and others, working with the National Hydropower Association, with tribal leaders and others to bring what to a degree have been warring parties over the last many decades together to create more common ground. And the framework for that was the, or is the three R's. A bunch of dams do need to be removed. A bunch need to be rehabilitated, stay there, but are unsafe or need a profound amount of maintenance. And some need to be retrofitted. Those are dams. And by the way, it's, Malcolm will talk about this, uh, less than 3% of all of our dams have hydropower. But a chunk of those would benefit greatly by being retrofitted with upgraded turbines or with fish passage. So investments that will make that hydropower facility either produce more electricity or be environmentally friendlier or what have you. But a dam and hydropower facility that we should invest in. And so the point of today's briefing is the need to invest whether removing dams, rehabilitating, making them safer or improving them and likely improving the hydropower output. So that's a key theme you will hear a couple of times. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more because it's a lot of the work that American Rivers leads with a lot of our partners on dam removal. This is one great example not far from here. I wanna say give or take an hour, an easy trip. Uh, American Rivers would love to be involved in giving folks tours. This is, was the Bloaty Dam on the Patapsco River Interestingly and unfortunately, this was a significant safety issue. There were many drownings at this dam site, about a 30 foot high dam, significant liability risk, and obviously a clear barrier to whether it's the, the shad, the herring, the alewives, and other fish. So this came down American Rivers in partnership, I think it was with Fish Wildlife Service, maybe with NOAA, um, took this dam down a number of years ago, and you can see kind of the series of events getting up there now is, I would suggest, truly an inspiration. You can see the improvement in clearly in habitat, obviously no longer a public safety issue, no longer a liability for the town that owned it, and 65 miles of river is now opened up for those fish and other freshwater critters, which by the way, are going extinct at twice the rate of land-based and ocean-based species, but for those fish to migrate, move up and down. Invariably, the best way to restore the health and dynamics and natural systems of a river is removing a dam, especially in a place like this where it was causing significant harm as well as safety issues. Now, this is what uh, our team refers to as the Red Rash map. Uh, these are all of the dams that we currently have roughly inventoried. It's over 500,000 dams throughout the country. Um, what's also interesting is people think, oh, dams, okay, yeah, important for flood control, irrigation, hydropower. That is all true. But actually, the percentage of these dams to those purposes that I just mentioned, flood control, irrigation, hydropower, is relatively small. It's 20, 30% of the dams. There are a lot of dams that are abandoned, very outdated, and a whole lot of the dams, you've got owners that are going, eh, I don't want that dam. We want it taken down, but yee, that's a lot of money to take it down. So the point is, there are a lot of dams that are not serving any useful purpose and definitely not serving their original purpose and are just sitting there waiting to be taken down. This is the uh, uh, graph of all the dams that have come down. Over 2,000 dams in the last 15, 20 years have come down, uh, opened up, I should know the number I don't, hundreds of thousands of miles of river, restoring the health and dynamics of those rivers. A couple examples that I do want to mention, we're in the process of celebrating, and this is 
kind of at the very end of the spectrum, the Klamath dams in Northern California, Southern Oregon are coming down for very large dams. It's actually the U.S.'s largest ecological restoration project. We're checking whether it's the world's largest ecological restoration project. And that was a situation where at the end of the day, the tribes, the state of California and Oregon, and the owner of that, those dams, Pacific Corps, after it was a many years of discussions, negotiations, back and forth, but all came together in agreement to take these dams down and jointly funded the removal of the dams to be taken down on the Klamath. It's in process. Uh, other stories throughout the country, but we are building the momentum for dam removal. Again, we're not saying all dams need to be taken down. Absolutely not, because there are a chunk that huh, just need to be rehabilitated for safety and some that need to be retrofitted for improved hydropower production. Now, on again the benefits of dam removal. It very much varies based on each dam, each river, each location, but often it's, as I alluded to earlier, improvement in migration of anadromous fish. To remind folks, anadromous fish are fish that spend a part of their lives, often the early year years, in that freshwater ecosystem of the river, migrate or travel out to the ocean to grow and live for a certain number of years, and then migrate back up to spawn again. Salmon being a classic example where the importance of, up in the Northwest at least, and somewhat in the East Coast, but migrating, sometimes they'll migrate 700 miles inland, 7,000 feet up to return to their spawning grounds. And by doing that, returning organic matter up into those headwaters. Removing dams on rivers like that allow the salmon to live, to thrive, to spawn. And yes, improves the ecological strength of those rivers, but also enables tribal communities that depend on those fish for both, yes, their, their, their traditional foods, but very much their cultural heritage. Other benefits, obviously, as I've alluded to, safety. Removing dams often is a safety issue, uh, tribal rights, and frankly, jobs. A lot of times you'll end up with greater recreational economic benefits with a dam out of there. Let me close where I began, and that is on dam removal, rehabilitation, and retrofitting. We're thrilled with the infrastructure bill that had over $2.4 billion to support this effort that Congress passed about two years ago, and is an opportunity for all of us to come together. Um, actually, with this close, actually, what I wanna do is jump to a video. Um, there's a couple that we've worked with, Rick and uh, Lotsey uh, Holton, who you're about to meet, um, that just want to share a quick story of a removal of a dam on their property. So let me throw it to you for that. And I do want to also thank this extraordinary, albeit all male, we'll do better, sorry again about that, but extraordinary partners and leaders. But Dan, to the video, please. Rick Holton, I hail from St. Louis, Missouri, a great river state, uh, surrounded by water. I'm Lotsey Herman Holton, my real name, Carlota Clark Herman, and seventh generation from William Clark of Lewis and Clark. So we have a long history of rivers and the love of water and floating rivers and fishing rivers and for many generations. Uh, my father was a Marine, and he was a fighter pilot, and he survived World War II and Korea, both. He was in both start to finish. He was always a conservative. He was a banker, and he was always very particular about not spending what you don't have. And so I learned that from a very early age, and, and that, con that conservative uh, attitude was instilled uh, at a young age. Along the way, I had a lot of wonderful childhood buddies that I grew up with. And one of those was um, uh, a gentleman by the name of Packy Offield, who was of the Wrigley family. And they, they uh, were from Chicago and came up to northern Michigan. And we became good friends. We were buddies, young kids together. My wife, Lotsey, and I, 
um, were at our house in Michigan, and Charles came in and said, your friend Packy and my friend Packy has passed away, and he has a piece of property that has a dam on it, and it's up here in, in Michigan, and I think you and Lotsey would be perfect for taking that property from the off-field estate and taking the dam out, which you know about from American rivers, from your time there, and get with it and restore the river. It was, it was a power dam, and then it fell sort of in the middle of where does it go from here when that source of power was no longer competitive, and it was in bad shape. It was, the dam was in rough shape. It, it needed a lot of work. And we had 24 sevens guarding and watching because it was a record runoff. And that was the year we bought the property. So all of the liability exposure was on our shoulders, but it, it held. And, and the next year we took the dam out. Uh, it's such a wonderful uh, thing to do, legacy thing to do. And so that's what we did. And we're in the middle of the sixth or seventh year of the restoration of the river. Well, if you can imagine a beautiful river having this dam for a hundred years and the fish and the no spawning and no trout and nothing. And you know the old joke, what, is, what do you say? What does the fish say when it hits the wall? Dam, that dam is gone. All the local people are thrilled. We have the salmon running up river now. We've restored about, what, a mile and a half of river right there near Pelston, Michigan. And it's very heartwarming and exciting when we go out and we do the catch and release and we see the fish and our children and our grandchildren love it and we kayak the river and we are very grateful and happy that we've done that job. What American Rivers taught me is there aren't two dams the same, ever. And I feel that's the most important question. What is this dam doing now? And is there a higher, better use for it? Maybe there isn't, you know? Maybe what it is, is what it needs to be. But there's 10,000 dams up in the Northeast and they all can't be necessary. So I would say this, if you have a piece of property that has a dam and it is not functioning for the people who, who are on that watershed, it needs to go. You gotta get to the middle and whatever people are doing in Washington, whoever's in our leadership positions, they need to get to the middle to get anything accomplished. And rivers have to have that, both sides have to be partisan. Uh, in certain respects, they have to be bipartisan. We're, we're not thinking of rivers long term uh, at, at all. So uh, we, we have to do it together. We have to do it together. Thank you, Tom, and thank you for introducing us to um, the Holdens uh, and um, hearing about their story. Um, while my colleague gets the slides back up, we will uh, turn to our next panelist, uh, and that is Malcolm Wolf. Malcolm is the president and CEO of the National Hydropower Association. Malcolm came to NHA after decades of experience in the energy and environment field. He served uh, in a cabinet level position for Maryland Governor Martin O'Malley, where he worked to promote affordable, reliable, Clean energy, and I was, you were my boss at that point, which was great, um, so I appreciate that. Uh, he also led energy policy for the National Governors Association. Malcolm has experience in both the executive branch and Capitol Hill, having served at the Environmental Protection Agency and as a congressional staff person uh, on the Environment and Public Works Committee, which is where I first met you, which was too long ago to say. So, <laughs> Malcolm, it always means a lot to have you part of EESI events. I'll welcome you to the lectern and turn it over to you. Thanks, Dan, and I think I've learned my lesson about you know, larger-than-life photos. I need to <laughs> uh, make sure I not make that mistake again. Um, so really, I'm excited to be here, um, and um, I think you can already get a sense of, of, the, of the partnership 
uh, on what I think historically has been battling sides. Um, and I think um, many of the sides have come to realize that we can get a whole lot more done by collaborating together. And we may not agree on every issue, but there's an awful lot where we do agree. Um, and so um, most of this event is going to focus on dam removal. And I think that makes sense. As you've already heard, um, there are 150,000 dams or 90,000 dams, depending on which study you want to use. But not all of those are serving a useful purpose. Um, but some of them are. So I want to focus on um, just kind of grounding us to, to remind us of the portion of dams that are serving a useful purpose. So it's a small number, but it's a major source of renewable energy. Uh, we like to think of it as America's first renewable energy resource. And I guess my bottom line, if you take nothing else away from, from my portion of this presentation, it's that as we transition to a 100% clean energy grid, you can't get there without flexible dispatchable hydropower. We're critical to keeping the rest of the, particularly a grid based on variable wind and solar, you need the hydropower to balance the grid and to firm it up. So just some basic statistics. Uh, we provide power to about 30 billion Americans. That's about 6 or 7% of overall US electricity. We're 30% currently of US uh, renewable energy. Interestingly, across the globe, we provide most renewable energy is hydropower. Um, we've got 80 gigawatts of existing conventional hydropower, but then also 22 gigawatts of that pump storage that Congresswoman uh, Custer was talking about. And I'll, I'll mention uh, later in my presentation why that is is so valuable. Um, nearly every state has um, hydropower. So um, for those of you from congressional offices, I put the, the website of Oak Ridge National Lab. They have a great interactive map. You can find the hydropower or pump storage in your state. I think it's every state except Delaware and Mississippi has some form of hydropower. So this, and when you look at models for how are we going to decarbonize the grid, most of the models just assume the hydropower doesn't grow, but they also assume it doesn't go away. And I think both of those assumptions actually don't stand up to scrutiny. Um, there's a lot going on in this next chart. Um, what I wanted really to focus in on was just one example, although there's probably an example like this every week or every month somewhere in the country. This happens to be, um, I think it's Portland or Seattle, um, in January, um, just before Martin Luther King weekend. They had a polar vortex come in, so really cold weather for Washington state. Um, the red line is the load. So the load is going up because it's really cold and everyone is turning on their heaters, uh, which they don't usually do. Um, at the same time, that green line, that's the wind. And if you look between January 11 and January 12, the wind drops off by about 2,000 megawatts. And it really doesn't come back for, for, for days. So at the same time, electricity load is going up, the wind dies off. And hydropower does what hydropower always does, is we release more water, we generate more power when the grid needs it. So that's, you know, they didn't have a major blackout, um, despite headlines and, and some concerns, because hydropower is kind of that water battery that, that Congresswoman Custer said. We can store our water when there's excess solar on the grid. We can release the water um, when, um, when the grid needs it. So it really is part of that critical 24-7 resource. Uh, I commented earlier that there are growth opportunities using the existing infrastructure. Um, and um, that's obviously critically important. Uh, I don't think we've built any major new dam in the lower 48 for 50 years. So you know, that conversation is generations behind us. What we're talking about now is how do we use the infrastructure that we already have? Um, and first of all, we need more storage. As we move to more variable load, we've got less spinning stuff. We've got less coal. We've got less natural gas. We're also having less nuclear. Um, as you go into more inverter-based resources, wind and solar, you need something to keep the grid moving. Um, pump storage is that long-duration energy storage. We're 96% of energy storage today. Love batteries. They're a great two-hour solution. String them together. Maybe they could be a four-hour solution or a six-hour solution. But there are going to be days when there, the wind isn't blowing, um, or you know, a cloud front has moved in, and you're not going to be able to recharge those batteries. So you need long duration energy storage. Pump storage is having a moment. There's a lot of more appreciation for the need as we move to more variable based renewables for this long duration energy storage. 96 projects in the pipeline with a potential capacity of 91 gigawatts. Um, most of those projects aren't going to be built 
just like most wind and solar projects proposed aren't built. Um, but if we can get some more gigawatts of long duration storage built, it enables a multiplier of other renewables. There's also the capacity to add generation to existing dams that are currently not powered and to increase the efficiency of the powered fleet. So overall, there's about 50 gigawatt potential of generation using largely existing resources. Um, that's the good news. The bad news is I'm afraid we're at fear of losing what we already have. We have 100 gigawatts of existing hydropower on the grid, but we've got about half of the non-federal fleet up for relicensing. And I should say that half of the fleet is federal. So the largest, you know, the largest renewable company in this country, you know, many people wouldn't say federal government, um, but it really is. It's the Corps of Engineers has more renewables than anybody else. Um, so they're not even counted in this. They're also having a similar concern of just retiring facilities uh, because it's easier to retire them than um, retire them and get a tax credit for building new wind and solar than maintain the existing. But in the federal, in the federal side, in the non-federal side, the side regulated by FERC, you've got 459 hydropower facilities up for relicensing in the next decade. That's 17 gigawatts of dispatchable hydro. Licensing takes seven and a half years on average, but often much longer. There are facilities still going through relicensing 10, 20, 25 years. The process can continue. Um, millions of dollars in paperwork. And then at the end of the day, you get a license that says we want you to upgrade it because it is a 50-year-old facility. That often costs hundreds of millions of dollars. You don't know what the costs are going to be or the length is going to be when you start the process. You've got a whole panoply of federal, state, and local jurisdictions that are involved. So not surprisingly that a third of hydropower owners are actively considering decommissioning their facility. Critically important for this audience, decommissioning a hydropower facility means you turn off the powerhouse. It does not mean you remove the dam. You don't, most of the communities don't want the dam removed because these are facilities that are used for flood control, irrigation, water storage, navigation. The hydropower facility was often put on board to offset the costs of those expenses. So um, in some cases, you've got an abandoned dam, love getting rid of those. But for the hydropower facilities, they're usually there because there's some other public purpose. And license surrender does not mean um, dam removal. Why are people considering um, surrendering licenses? Here are three existing problems relevant to this audience. Uh, lack of tax parity. Uh, after the Inflation Reduction Act, if you want to build something new that's carbon free, you get a tax credit. If you want to maintain a carbon free nuclear, there's 30 billion. Um, to maintain existing hydropower, nothing. So that makes it really hard to justify these investments. We've got an antiquated licensing process that we're working collaboratively with a number of groups on, and there's market design failures. So my final comment as I'm getting the please wrap up notice mm -hmm. is that there is a useful purpose for, for maybe it's that 2% or 3% 2 or of dams, but dam removal is no longer a four letter word in appropriate circumstances, consent of the dam owner, it's no longer serving a useful purpose. Dam removal can be um, uh, overdue, and scaling it would be a great thing. I'll leave it for there. Malcolm, I'll give you your card back. Oh, thank you. There you go. Uh, thanks for that. That was a great presentation. Um, like to just take a moment. Uh, Malcolm had lots of great stats and lots of great charts in his slides. Just as a reminder, uh, presentation materials for the session today. Are, first of all, they're printed um, out on the front table. Um, they're also available on our website at www.esi.org. If you want to go back and rewatch any of the presentation, you can do that also by visiting the briefing page for today. Uh, and eventually, it'll take us a little while, but eventually we'll also have written summary notes. So if you are thinking about dam removal three weeks from now or four weeks from now or whatever it is, uh, and you really maybe can't watch the whole briefing again, you can at least skim and get back up to speed very quickly. Um, that brings us to our third panelist of the day. Uh, uh, Kai Adlakia is the director of the Federal Emergency Management Agency Dam National Dam Safety Program. Kai has over 10 years of experience in emergency management at the federal level and in the private sector. At FEMA, he has served as director of hazard mitigation in, uh, and was the deputy division director for risk reduction. He has held the position of acting deputy admin assistant administrator for FEMA's recovery division. During Hurricane Sandy, Kayad represented FEMA at the Rebuild by Design competition led by the Department of Housing and Urban Development. 
and advocated for resilient building and sustainable land use practices. And in the aftermath of hurricanes Sandy and Maria, Kaid led the implementation of FEMA's largest mitigation portfolio. Kaid, welcome to the briefing today. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much for having me, and thank you, Dan, uh, for the well, uh, welcome and invite. Uh, a few of you may be wondering, what is FEMA doing at a dam conference? Uh, so let me share with you, yes, you're absolutely right. Uh, FEMA's primary purpose is to uh, respond to uh, disasters. Uh, but as our mission statement states, uh, FEMA's mission is to help people before, during, and after disasters. and. In my role as a director of National Dam Safety, uh, my intention is to make sure that even before things become a disaster, we put actions in place to make sure that we don't uh, get to the point where we need to have uh, disasters. So how do we do this? There are four fundamental principles of the National Dam Safety Program, and I will briefly mention each four of those to you. Uh, the first one is the leadership. Uh, FEMA is the lead agency for uh, coordinating the federal response, and we do this through a body known as the ICOD, so the Interagency Committee on Dam Safety. This consists of several federal dam partners who are involved uh, in the dam profession, and also the NDSRB, the National Dam Safety Review Board, which in addition to the ICOD's members consists of several state partners and private industry partners as well. Um, these two bodies are very active and play an instrumental role in making sure that FEMA leads this effort to ensure dam safety nationally. Uh, the second fundamental principle is public awareness. Um, the way we do this through the two bodies is also to make sure that we communicate to the public uh, that we, in fact, uh, are taking steps to keep our dams safe. Um, a few things which we do to uh, to, to achieve that, to enable that, is um, the two bodies play a big role in promoting uh, the annual National Dam Safety Day, which is on May 31st, as you may be aware. Uh, and we hold several outreach sessions and public campaigns to promote dam safety. Uh, many of you may be aware, uh, as mentioned previously, that the nation's dams are 64 years or older, and in some places like New Hampshire, uh, maybe a century old. And uh, also, there are 91,000 dams just in the NID, but the number could be as high as half a million. And in addition, the American Society for Civil Engineers has rated the dams in our nations at a D grade. Uh, collectively, when we look at the uh, reports from the uh, Association of State Dam Safety Officials, uh, the estimate to re rehabilitate the dams nationally is close to $158 billion. Now that's a lot of money and a lot of effort which needs to be put in to make sure that our dams are up to speed. Um, we have sadly suffered over uh, 1,300 dam failures. 80% of those, no surprise, have occurred in the last 20 years as of our infrastructure and our dam age. Uh, also, it has resulted in over 1,400 fatalities nationally. So what we can do to promote dam safety is obviously very important. We also do this through technical assistance. FEMA hosts over 120 publications related to dam safety. And um, what we do is uh, Congress, when it passed the bipartisan infrastructure law, also dedicated a portion of the funding to make sure that we undertake and continue the research to update outdated, outdated publications, but then also make sure that we identify other publication which needs to be put in place to promote dam safety. Last year, we collected a panel of around 55 people, uh, national experts in the dam profession, to brainstorm ideas as to where we should be paying attention. And I'm happy to share that we have identified 34 projects which FEMA is going to undertake over the next three years to continue primary research in technical guidance and uh, research. Lastly, we do this through financial assistance. We have two grant programs. Uh, the first one, state assistance, enables states to make sure that they undertake activities such as periodic assessments of their dams 
uh, to make sure that their dams are kept up to speed and also to make sure that the HHPD program, which came into existence only in 2019, is uh, the program through which states can undertake the three R's. I won't go over the three R's, but as, I, as you can see, um, the 800 million given through a bill to FEMA was a 100-fold growth in funding to FEMA to undertake all these activities. Uh, removal, obviously, is a big part of what we undertake as well. And I want to mention here that removal has always been an eligible activity under HHPD. And as I conclude the presentation, I will share with you that we have, in fact, with the HHPD program, completed the first successful dam removal in Wellsville, Ohio. So let, as you can see here, uh, there is collaboration with Fish and Wildlife Service and FEMA. I'm very grateful for our partnership with Siva and his colleagues uh, on Fish and Wildlife Service. And what we have done is we have, in fact, uh, uh, partnered with them to detail an individual from his office to ours for the past year. And we will be continuing that relationship for an additional two years, I'm happy to share. And both agencies have agreed to share that cost for two more years. Why is that important? Um, had I known um, four years ago what I know today when we undertook Wellsville, Ohio, we would have done some things slightly differently. The two mission statements of the two agencies, as you can see, are somewhat different. And obviously, we want to make sure that those two differences need not be mutually contradictory. We uh, obviously want to make sure that we keep in mind that we collaborate with them fully, and we not only do we take into consideration the technical aspects of dam removal, but also make sure that we allow room for fish passage and other uh, organism passage. So obviously, this slide ends, as it says, with success, but then also a lessons learned. Um, even though this was a fairly small project, it took close to four years to accomplish, uh, and um, a small project, again, a million dollars. Uh, and this is something which we are working towards in making sure that as we release additional funding, we keep in mind the larger, uh, uh, larger aspects of the program, the mutually beneficial aspects of the program, beyond just the technical aspects. So with that, once again, I thank you very much for inviting me. And I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Fred. Very much. And perfect segue to my reminder is that we will have time for questions today. We have a very robust online audience today. So thank you, everyone watching at home or from your offices. I know today's a big like appropriations deadline day. So plenty of excuses to go around for maybe not joining us in person. But in our online audience, thank you so much. If you're in our online audience and you have a question, you can send it to us by email. And the email address to use is ask, that's A-S-K at ESI.org. And for folks in the room, we'll have a microphone go around, uh, and we'll have lots of time for Q&A for that. Our fourth panelist today is Shiva Sundarisan. Shiva is the Deputy Director of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And before joining the service, uh, he served as a program officer at the Wilberforce Foundation. He joined the foundation after having served as Director of Conservation at the Greater Yellowstone Coalition where he oversaw its conservation efforts, working in partnership with agencies, landowners, and other nonprofits. Shiva's background is in wildlife biology and behavioral ecology, and we're really, really happy to have you today. Thanks, and uh, let me progress the slide for you. Oops, one more. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. I'm really privileged to be amongst this panel. Um, thank you so much to all of you who spoke, and I look forward to hearing more after I'm done. Um, let me see if I know how to do this. So as you've heard before from the, the Congresswoman, Tom, Malcolm, and, and Kayed, I think um, I'll reinforce the point that um, everybody has made so far, which is dam removal does not have to be seen as something we fight over. There's actually a lot that we have in common over bringing some of these dams down. Um, the second thing I'd like to motivate is um, the Fish and Wildlife Service, and actually Kayad had our mission up there earlier, so I'll take advantage of that. The Fish and Wildlife Service um, looks at dam removal through the lens of fish passage, aquatic connectivity, and sort of freshwater habitat, right? Like, we're the guys in charge of the critters, so that's really what we care about. That's how we look at this issue. Um, despite that, I, I, what I'd uh, like to motivate here, and what I'll, I'll talk about the rest of the, uh, the few minutes that I have is the work the Fish and Wildlife Service is doing 
um, on aquatic connectivity, some of the broader benefits that we see on this, and then the work that the service is doing um, along with our other federal partners. Um, to get back to sort of this question of, um, is this something that we fight over or is this something that we can work around? Um, we at the service really believe that if we work strategically and collaboratively, the issue of dam removal, aquatic passage, fish connectivity is something that we can all get around that has multiple benefits. Um, I will try to motivate that by telling you a story about the picture in this, in this photograph. Um, this was a dam that was providing um, municipal water supply to a town, Seaside, Oregon. Um, the dam was well past its usable life, was unsafe, was creating some problems. It also happened to be um, preventing passage for an Endangered Species Act listed fish species. Um, so we worked, the Fish and Wildlife Service several years ago, more than 10 years ago, provided some funding and were able to work in partnership with sort of local partners, the town to bring that dam down. Um, that makes it the town's water supply safer, it makes the sort of people who live in that area safer, and it protects fish. Um, so really, I think what I'd like to motivate with this is um, when we think of dam removal, when we think of fish passage, it's not just about fish, whether they're salmon, shad, herring. It's not just about dams. It's about broader benefits to communities. And I'm saying that as somebody from the Fish and Wildlife Service. And we have tons of stories about this in other places where we have people who think, who's, who's, whose lives have been improved because we're bringing dams down or we're making fish passage better across roads and streams. So typically, um, the Fish and Wildlife Service has been working on this effort through our fish passage program. It's been in place since 1999. We get a small amount of congressionally appropriated funding for this program every year. And in the last 20 years, we've done a ton of work, 64,000 stream miles with over 2,000 partners, we removed 3,500 barriers, and, and most of our money is just one third of, of sort of the broader projects involved. Um, a couple of years ago, with the passage of the bipartisan infrastructure law, we received a significant amount of money that really enabled us to sort of scale our work up in a, in a huge way. We got $200 million over the sort of five-year program. Um, and in the last three years, we've managed to get about $143 million out the door, so to speak, in 122 projects in 40 different states. These projects leveraged about $192 million. And when complete, these things are all happening right now, as we speak, 346 barriers with over 12,000 miles and almost a million acres of habitat. A um, couple of small things about this. Uh, there's, there's three years of money that's gone out the door, although in this third year, we took advantage of the fact that we were able to send um, uh, uh, two years of funding out the door at the same time. Um, this next slide is a map of, of all the places where um, our funding has gone to, to remove some of these barriers. Um, of about 350 or so barriers um, that our funding has gone to remove, about 80 of them have been dams. Um, some of which have come down, or in other cases where we, where we haven't been able to bring the dam down, we've at least tried to do um, some kind of, uh, not retrofit in the way you guys are using it, but at least get some kind of fish passage um, uh, uh, across the dam uh, in that space. Um, what I'd like to motivate here, and, and you saw some pictures from some of the other uh, folks earlier, is our program um, works really closely with the partners in the room, whether it's American Rivers, whether it's um, nonprofits, it's uh, local communities, other agencies. Um, and before we get to the point where we have those big yellow trucks moving dirt and bringing dams down, um, there's a ton of work that goes into design of the project, um, uh, grant applications, permitting, logistics, um, and even sort of creating the necessary infrastructure on the ground both socially, politically, and uh, uh, ecologically for these projects to happen. And, and the Fish and Wildlife Service funding, thankfully, is quite flexible and, and able to, uh, to, to support needs that are not otherwise typically seen as being essential. So um, really wanted to motivate the idea that there's a ton of work before the work um, and, 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 and hope that's something that you, know, you guys um, think about. The other thing I'd like to also um, stress here is when we put out our most recent call this last year for, for projects that um, we thought that where, where we, people apply for fish passage funding, um, we had allocated about between 70 and $80 million to go out the door. We got requests of about $575 million, um, from all across the country. Um, these are typically, and 
projects that are ready to go right now. So there is significant demand um, for this effort. There's tons of places where if we had funding today, um, projects could happen potentially literally tomorrow. Um, the second uh, bullet here talks about uh, what we at the Fish and Wildlife Service are calling the Transformational Fish Passage Project List. I will come to this in the next slide, but one of the things that the bipartisan infrastructure law has allowed us to do is to create a federal interagency task force. This is a group of 13 federal agencies, all of which received some kind of funding through the bipartisan infrastructure law for fish passage. And these agencies have been collaborating in ways that they have never done before to make sure that some of the funding that they've received is delivered strategically and thoughtfully in a transformative way, where we're, where we're leveraging each other's money, where we're building on the benefits, not just to fish and, and freshwater habitat, but to communities, to climate and so on. And so we were trying to put together a list of projects that fit certain criteria that were between 30 and $50 million that no individual agency could to, do on its own that was pretty much ready to go in the next three to five years. And um, our list of projects, just talking to the other agencies, um, came up to close to $2 billion here. So this is really something to, to uh, emphasize how much scope and how much work we can do. Um, and this, these are some of the agencies that are working on this interagency task force. Um, and Kayed also uh, incidentally had a slide in there with the fish passage portal earlier, um, talking about some of the shared data and all the work that's gone into um, these agencies working collaboratively where DOT, for example, in that culvert program talks to us about what, pro what projects we should fund and we, the Fish and Wildlife Service, sort of talk about what projects we can fund that might be um, sort of of interest to DOT. So I um, just want to uh, leave you with the fact that there's a ton of opportunity where agencies can work together. Um, it's really clear that there's a, a, a huge amount of work to be done um, through the lens of dam removal, through the lens of aquatic connectivity for fish passage. Um, there's bigger benefits, broader benefits to um, communities, to fish from all of this. Um, there's a jobs angle on this. We've just started doing some economic analysis on our uh, some of the funding that we've uh, allocated, and we're realiz realizing that for every million dollars we put on the ground, there's sort of an economic kickback of a million and a half, um, dozens of jobs created by uh, working on uh, restoration. So uh, overall, really excited about sort of the work the Fish and Wildlife Service is doing, really excited about the opportunity we have to work with the entire federal family on the interagency task force, and um, sort of thoughtful about how this is bigger than just bringing dams down and getting fish across streams. It's important to communities. It's important to sort of our future um, and sort of the lives we lead together. So thank you so much and look forward to the questions. Um, I've consumed a lot of dam removal content in the last couple of days. And I've kind of just realized that I love looking at pictures of dams. Um, I don't know. I feel like I could just look at them all day. Um, I also think, Shiva, you might win the award today. I feel like in every briefing we get something, some term of art that would be a good band name. And I think transformational fish, pa fish passage it would be a really good band name. I don't know what kind of music it would be exactly, but I think I would go see transformational fish, pa fish passage. Um, it's hard to say. <laughs> so as a man taking credit for somebody else's work, that actually was Shannon, Shannon Boyle sitting right there from the Fish and Wildlife Service. So. Shannon's the bassist or the lead singer, hopefully. Um, well, something that you talked a little bit about is how much work goes into this project before. A lot of work actually also on the back end. Uh, and that's something I think we'll hear a little bit about from our next panelist, which is, uh, who is David Gould. David is the director of the Department of Marine and Environmental Affairs at the town of Plymouth, Massachusetts. Under his direction, the department has made great strides in conservation, becoming known for ambitious and successful river restoration projects, the protection of open space, a model beach management plan, and stormwater pollution remediation projects. David began his work in Plymouth as the National Resources Officer administrating the Endangered Shorebird Program at the town's three-mile-long uh, three barrier beach. David, thanks for coming all the way down to D.C. today, and, or for, for our briefing today, and uh, turn it over to you. Thank you very much for having me. Um, I am David Gould. I'm the director of a department in the town of Plymouth, Massachusetts called Marine Environmental Affairs. And we essentially have two pillars. Uh, we protect and manage open space 
um, and we buy a lot of open space. And so one of the tools that we've used over the last 23 years to do that uh, in a community that is over 400 years old is dam removal, and we've done quite a few of those. So I'd like to uh, go through some of the work we've done uh, in the last 23 years and uh, talk to you about a uh, little bit about that. So we talk about the age of dams. Um, we still have a dam that dates back to 1636. So if that doesn't tell you we have some old dams in the United States, I'm not sure what will. So a little bit of an introduction. Um, I think oftentimes in biological terms, so I think of dam removals very much like uh, what I refer to as edge habitat. So edge habitat is this unique interface of multiple habitats where they all come together. And oftentimes, those have the most richness or diversity of plants and vegetation and wildlife. And I think dam removals, for me, are very similar to that. Um, so dam removals are projects where so many unique thing come, things come together. And I think that's one of the unique benefits of doing these projects. So there's ecological benefits and resiliency and public safety and financial benefits. Oh. There we go. I think oftentimes people know that a lot of the drivers for dam removals are ecological ones, and that's very true for some of the projects we've done in Plymouth. We worked uh, oftentimes to restore diadromous fish passage for our, our river herring. So those are alewife and blueback herring and also American eel. And so those are often the reasons why we initiate uh, dam removals, but there's so much more that goes into it from an ecological standpoint. There's tremendous benefit for connectivity um, and we oftentimes think about aquatic uh, uh, connectivity, but also for terrestrial animals. So when we can en enlarge a culvert or a dam that's associated, uh, or a bridge that's associated with that dam, we can improve uh, pit, uh, fat passage for fish, but also for terrestrial wildlife. There's also significant water quality improvements. Um, these dams often have large impoundments that get very, very warm. And if you're a, a brook trout living downstream of this large impoundment, it's discharging warm water. That's a pretty place, a uh, pretty tough place to live. So we can do a lot of improvements uh, ecologically with these dam removals, but we can also set our communities up for a lot of resiliency. So when we replace larger bridges and culverts, uh, we can pass larger storm events. And I think we all know that we get very different rain events than we ever used to. Oftentimes our infrastructure dates back and was designed for uh, flows in the 1960s and 70s. Those aren't quite the flows we get anymore. So we're able to make our communities and the people who live downstream of those um, much more resilient to the changes that we're seeing. We can also do a lot of uh, regulatory requirements that municipalities and cities, towns have to do. There's oftentimes stormwater improvements that are associated with these projects and can, we can often meet our NIPTES requirements. There's also public safety benefits to these. I think most folks can um, can relate to these dams, especially when they date back. Um, most of our dams that we've removed date back to the 1790s to about the 1850s, the time of industrial revolution in the Northeast, and these are very old structures. So when we have people who drive over these structures um, and we can replace them with new modern infrastructure, we're not only benefiting fish and wildlife, we're benefiting uh, people and the community in which we work. We're working on a dam right now that the fire department can't drive over because it has a weight limit on it. And so the driver might be ecological, but the benefits are much more broad than that. We also have dams that we are required to inspect and maintain. And what's fascinating to me is we often had uh, dams and these, these structures in town that we would inspect and maintain that didn't serve a purpose anymore. So when you work in a city and town and you're spending money on a structure that doesn't need to be there and doesn't serve a purpose, that makes no sense. So we need to remove those structures and use that money in a, in a much better way. The last uh, point I'd like to make about how broad dam removals can be are, is the financial one. Um, I'm probably going to date myself a little here, but I don't, I, I don't mind doing that. A few decades ago, there was a Speaker of the House here in Washington who was from Massachusetts, and his name was Thomas Tip O'Neill. And he, had, he wasn't the originator of the saying, but he had a great saying that all politics are local. And when you work for a city or town, you know that to be very true. And so cities and towns need help doing these kinds of projects. Uh, we're very creative on our own, but the work that's done here in Washington or in our capital in Boston makes a huge difference for cities and towns. And so we spend a lot of time doing these projects. We write grants nonstop. We have great partners, Fish and Wildlife Service and NOAA, some of our biggest. And 
we've also been really creative on our own local level, creating local funding sources from wind and solar to create seed money to do that initial work to get to the construction for some of these projects. So when you're in a municipality and you're competing with schools and police and fire and DPW, um, and you want to do a dam removal project, you need to be creative and find unique ways to fund your projects. Um, and so we do that. And that cost sharing is really critical get, to getting these projects done. So with all that being said, I'd like to speak to you about one uh, stream that we've worked an awful lot on. Um, this is a photograph, uh, underwater photograph, of our town brook, which is a historic stream that runs through the center of Plymouth. Um, since uh, 2001, when we started doing these dam removals, um, we've been able to remove five dams from this one stream. There's one left. That is the 1636 dam that still remains in place, but we're working on that one now. Um, we've had the cost benefit sharing with some of our amazing partners like NOAA and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to replace four of the bridges and culverts that were associated with these structures. So um, without those federal partners, we wouldn't be able to do a lot of this work. I will say, though, however, um, a little shout out to the community in which I work for. We've had a lot of conversations over the years with NOAA, um, and I can say that the town of Plymouth has spent more money on dam removals than many states. So we get partnerships and we get grants, but the town also steps up, and that's a big part of what we do. For me, what's really gratifying is when we started working on this herring run. Uh, this herring run was sustained by going to the most downstream dam and picking up fish, putting them in a truck, and trucking them up to the headwater so they could spawn. And if that's not sad and doesn't get you angry, doesn't want to have you do a dam removal, I don't know what will. So back then, we had an estimated population of 30,000. Um, we had a population run last year of 235, and we're probably going to exceed that this year. So what I think we've been able to do uh, with our program townwide is that now dam removals in Plymouth are very common. Um, they're a common practice and something we do. So townwide, we've been able to remove 13 dams. We've replaced seven new bridges and culverts, thousands of linear feet of ancillary benefits for water and sewer and stormwater. We've improved water quality uh, significantly, and we've made um, our streams resilient for fish, wildlife, and people. And so I just want to thank all of you for all you do. Um, it does get down to the local cities and towns. And thank you for uh, having me here today. Thank you, David. Here, I'll give you your name card back. Thank you. There are lots of great reasons to visit Plymouth. And one of them would be to go see the dams that aren't there, um, <laughs> which is kind of amazing. So thanks very much for your presentation. Um, we are going to transition now, uh, and we're just killing it on time. So we'll have a great Q&A uh, discussion with our panel. Um, and uh, if you're in our online audience, one last reminder, you can send us an email. And the email address to use is ask, ask at esi.org. My colleague Nicole is in the back of the room, and she has a microphone. Uh, and if you raise your hand, uh, we will do our best to get to you. Um, but our Q&A, we're going to have some shared responsibility today for the questions and answers. So I'd like to introduce our friend at American Rivers, Katie Schmidt. Katie is the Associate Director of the National Dam Removal Program and a real expert and perfect person to lead us through the Q&A. And I'll be keeping an eye on the online questions that may be coming in. So Katie, turn it over to you. Thank you, Dan. And thank you so much to our panel. Um, it was really great to hear all the different perspectives on the importance of dam safety and keeping structures that are staying in place safe and removing the ones that are obsolete and unsafe to protect our populations. So we have one question that we're going to start with, and then we will open it up, as Dan said, to folks in the room and folks that are joining us online. Um, Tom, we are going to start with you, and then we are going to work our way down the panel in, in order of who talked first. So. Our first question for our panel is, what can be done to help facilitate the collaboration between river stakeholders, agencies, and tribes to advance dam safety and dam removal work? All righty, thank you. Um, that's a wonderful softball because it takes me back, you know, we are at least consistent. It takes me back to the three R's and as members and staff here on Capitol Hill are thinking about legislation and you're thinking about the important, and I agree with Malcolm's summary, the important role of hydropower on the grid. It is important to firm up other sources. So if you're thinking about, hey, what can I do for hydropower? 
Think also about in that same legislation, hmm, what do I need to be doing on dam safety or dam removal? In other words, try to be, because it's bipartisan, it's pragmatic, try to be moving forward all of the three R's. Or if you're looking at legislation or thinking about a policy for dam removal, that's great. But think about, ooh, wait, is there a dimension here of this policy to advance rehabilitation, i.e. dam safety issues, or advance hydropower? So I strongly suggest pragmatically, politically, to be holistic and think about the three R's. Um, trying to think, what, what what can I add to Tom's comment there? Um, maybe I'll just I'll just share a quick story. Um, before Tom joined American Rivers, uh, I met with his predecessor, Bob Irvin, um, and tried to get a sense of where um, why why were NHA and American Rivers kind of battling each other at every turn. And I asked him, you know, how many dams were removed last year? And I think that particular year there were 60. And, you know, how many are out there? You know, 90 uh, or, or 90,000, right? Or 100, and, you know, 500,000, depending on what numbers you want to use. So we're talking the scale of effort here, uh, the scale of what has to happen. Um, if a dam is no longer serving a purpose, it should be gotten rid of. But it's not easy. Uh, and when I asked um, Bob, why are you focusing on power dams as opposed to non-power dams? Kind of a wry smile came on his face and said, well, with power dams, there's a licensing process. There's a, there's a regulatory process we can engage in. And with non-power dams, it's like pushing a rope. There's just, it's just a lot harder. There's no, there's no particular mechanism. Um, but for a power dam, if it's powered, it's probably powered for a reason. Um, you've got a licensee who's bringing in revenue, selling the electricity. You've got well-funded opposition to a dam removal fight. When you've got a non-power dam, um, if it's not serving a useful purpose, the community's gonna want it to go away. So part of this effort, you know, five years down the road, is how can we scale both? How can we address the climate crisis by addressing, by creating additional carbon-free dispatchable power if you've already got a non-power dam? And how can we get rid of dams if they're not serving a useful purpose and scale that up? So I think the, the bipartisan infrastructure law was a great example of collaboration where we got um, a couple billion dollars, but the problem is much bigger. And so we need to, we need to scale that up. So I'm gonna build on Malcolm's comment on scaling up. Um, as you all know, a lot of agencies received funding under the bipartisan infrastructure law uh, but there is something unique about the 800 million which FEMA received. As you may, most of you may know, FEMA does not own or operate or regulate any dams. So this really is your money, and hopefully we are good stewards of that funding. Uh, we want to make sure that you all apply, states apply to this, and not be intimidated by the federal grants process. Uh, I understand scaling up is not always easy, um, in fact, it's quite hard, especially when we are encountering uh, match issues of 35% match on the local share. Uh, so we want to make sure that you all are familiar with the different means available. Uh, the match can be non-financial as well, and also ways in which we can combine funding through different federal agencies and the CORE's uh, SWIFT P program, the loan program, for example. Uh, there are different ways we can satisfy that match requirement. Uh, but most importantly, if you have not applied to a federal grant before, please do. We are here to help. We are here to assist. Thank you. Thanks, all. Uh, that was fantastic. I will add, I say yes to Tom, Malcolm, and Kayed, and say, um, from the federal family's perspective, I think bipartisan infrastructure law and the funding we received really allowed us to do things that we had never done before. Um, and work together as one federal family in a way that we have never done before. It would be great to see that continue, and it would be a, a, a bad if it didn't. Um, so to, to the extent that that, that effort um, could, would, would remain durable, I, I think that's great. I think we already spoke about the demand, the need for, uh, for all of this, so there's, so there's no question there. Um, and specifically, the Fish and Wildlife Service, I think, uh, this administration and hope, hopefully future administrations makes a commitment to uh, sort of investing money in uh, monies in places that uh, haven't previously received this kind of stuff, underserved communities, uh, justice 40 communities, and, and, and the whole commitment that this administration has made. So, um, you know, the more of that that we can do, and as Kaya had said, 
The federal family working together is trying really hard to make it easier to access the money that we have. And, and to the extent that you can help us do that, the better. So I'm going to take advantage of uh, the opportunity of being in Washington today to pick on uh, Boston. And so one of the changes I think we could make right off the bat um, would be to change the regulatory nature of dam removals. So I think we can do, uh, we've been doing dam removals long enough that we know what we're doing. And I think we can scale back some of that permitting um, in the regulatory nature of it and drive the cost savings down so we can actually do more work. Um, and I think that's critically important. The second, um, I would, I would encourage uh, other cities and towns to work with the federal agencies um, I will say that over the two decades that I've been working on dam removals, um, the colleagues that I've been able to work with at U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the NOAA Restoration Center have been unbelievably supportive. And it's not just about the funding, it's about the support and the technical services um, and the ability to just help you through project management. So I know a little, a uh, few cities and towns might be hesitant to do that, but I would really encourage it because the more cities and towns we can get doing this kind of work, that's when we're really going to make a nationwide impact. Thank you all for those great answers to those questions. Um, do we have any questions from the room? Okay, Nicole, you, you mind coming on up with the mic? First of all, thank you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, thank you so much for taking the time to come here and talk on the issue today. Uh, the question I had was just, I was wondering if any or all of you could speak a little bit more about the kinds of resources that states and local governments can actually access to get this done, a bit more about how that process works, and I guess how they can go about getting involved in that. I'll start and look to my colleagues to build on this answer. First of all, there is a whole suite of opportunities, and the reality is I don't know of a dam removal project that doesn't require a suite of funding. So, for example, we've spent a bunch of time talking about federal funding, whether it's Fish, Wildlife, NOAA, et cetera. Many states, a number of states will have an interagency at the state level, task force or a team, whether it's an aquatic connectivity team or whatever, that has expertise, skills, resources, potentially dollars, Similar, you've got whether it's the conservation community, whether American Rivers or Nature Conservancy or other groups will have dollars. They're often, frankly, individuals in towns, foundations, other philanthropic sources. So the reality is it takes and, and there are a whole suite of funding that you kind of need to piece together. I would say the place to start, um, often removing a dam, you need to start with some seed funding put together a plan. What's the feasibility study? Is this doable? What do the stakeholders in the community think? We are always conscious. What does a dam owner think? We don't want to take down a dam where it's going to be a huge hassle because the dam owner wants the dam. Ugh, we'll move on to the next dam. So the point is um, often starting with a feasibility study and often, frankly, whether it's a community foundation, an individual, a small family foundation, a uh, nonprofit can fund that initial work. Thanks for that question. Um, again, I'll, I'll plug the Interagency Fish Passage Task Force. Um, that group, you're sitting right next to Shannon there to your right, um, worked really hard to put together a portal. Um, and we've tried to collect in that portal um, funding opportunities from all the different federal agencies that received any kind of fish passage related funding through the bipartisan infrastructure law. Now, the bipartisan infrastructure law typically funded existing programs. So um, each of those programs, depending on which agency or which department it sits in, comes with a slightly different set of criteria and conditions. Um, the Fish and Wildlife Services Fish Passage Program tends to be pretty flexible and can fund a variety of things and a variety of entities. FEMA, you heard from Kaya, it has its own restrictions on what states it funds. I guess. Probably the government. Government. Cool, sounds good. Um, uh, a DOT has money from through that culvert program. Um, you heard about some of the money that NOAA has. Uh, so there's different parts of funding. And as Tom said, usually these projects all occur because sort of someone stitches together different different parts of funding and, and, and brings it all together. So um, yeah, what I would like to sort of offer is um, help the federal family work to create that one storefront, right? So to the extent that we can 
to the folks on the ground, whether it's a city or a town or in some cases a state or a community um, or a tribal government, um, hel help us sort of uh, provide uh, one storefront so you can come to us and we can help you uh, identify sort of the best funding part of relevant to the project that you want to do? So it's a great question. And, and I'm, I'm, as I mentioned, I'm aware that uh, states do encounter difficulties in applying uh, sometimes. And we want to make sure that we don't simply uh, make our grants so complex that only the states with the most capabilities and capacities end up applying to them, because that only furthers the inequities in our programs. Uh, so to that end, I mean, I'll just use one example. For example, one of the prerequisites is that the state who applies for our HHPD funding has an emergency action plan in place. Well, not all communities may have an EAP in place, in which case what we do is um, to create an emergency action plan, we need to have some downstream inundation mapping, and that's available. FEMA funds that. Uh, it's a program known as DSS WISE, uh, and essentially you can do downstream mapping uh, Ninety percent of them are done within 75 minutes, freely available. You just got to request uh, access to it. It's hosted by the University of Mississippi, and it's a highly successful program, which uh, FEMA funds, and it's available to anybody to download and use. So those are that's just one instance of where we can actively help applicants um, work through the prerequisites and the requirements for the program. I'll add one additional thought. Um, as you've already heard, um, it's hard piecing together these projects. It's harder than it should be. Um, one thing, since we're sitting here in the Capitol, that could make it easier. Uh, the pending, there is pending legislation that's bipartisan, bicameral, that would create a tax credit, a 30% tax credit for uh, environmental improvements, dam safety improvements, and that includes removal of river obstructions, dam removals. Obviously, if you're taking a tax credit, it would be the dam owner or the entity doing the work. So it's obviously something that the facility owner wants to do. Um, the bill numbers, um, S2994, sponsored by Senators Murkowski and Cantwell. Uh, in the House, it's HR 6653. Adrian Smith and Senator Del Bene are the lead. Um, if your bosses are not, you know, check to see if your bosses are already co-sponsors. If not, that would be a great way to help. So one thing I'd like to say on a positive side is that uh, our first dam removal project that we did back in 2001, I think we had nine different grants to support that one project. And the last thing you probably want is a uh, biologist doing grant management for nine different accounts, um, or at least the finance director would probably say that. I will say that over the years that's changed dramatically and we can now do projects with two or three funding sources, which is um, significant improvement in the amount of funding that's available for uh, cities and towns. Um, and nonprofits to go after and get these projects done. So I think, um, I think it's always a challenge, but I think it's improved dramatically over the last uh, two decades. Thank you. Thank you for that great question. We've got one more in the crowd with time. Okay, Nicole, thanks. Come on up. Um, raise your hand a little higher. Thank you. Anyone want to jump in? Sure. So I will. Um, yeah. What's how do you have an put an economic value on removing dams? And the second part was monitoring. Thank you. Yeah, monitoring the the economic benefit of dam removal. And she especially said um, with contentious projects, how do you help measure that? Is that a good? Okay. Thanks. <laughs> So I'll break my response into two parts. Um, the first one is easy. Uh, FEMA does not require a benefit cost analysis, you'll be happy to hear. Uh, what we do require instead is, uh, based on all the dams in your state, uh, we ask you to prioritize. So all things being equal, we have provided you a tool 
um, which, whereby you can do your own assessment to determine which would be worthy of submitting to rehabilitation. Uh, premise being that obviously there is always more number of dams than funding available. So we want to make some uh, decisions based on which dam would be the most worthwhile to fund. Uh, the second part of your question on monitoring, long-term monitoring is more difficult. Um, I was using this example yesterday. Um, we, FEMA, typically buys out lots of homes in floodplains. Um, that's easy. We can do some surge modeling of floods and coastal areas and determine how many uh, losses we would have avoided uh, from buying or elevating those homes. Uh, with dams or fish passages to assess those long-term uh, effects is harder. And that's where somebody like the detailee we have from Fish and Wildlife, we are hopeful, uh, would help us in framing some of the criteria as to what should we monitor, what should we measure, uh, especially beyond the grant period. Our grant period typically is three years. And once that ends, uh, the state typically does not have any responsibility of reporting us to us, to FEMA. Uh, and we, we want to make sure that there is mechanisms in place whereby there can be some long-term monitoring. It's a harder question to answer. Thank you. If I can just put out a quick comment to part of your question, it is after now this country's taken out over 2,000 dams, there's a lot of experience. We've got a lot of private sector, small, medium, large engineering firms that have done a lot. So I would say we turn to the private sector and the expertise that they've got on, yes, the monitoring and the cost estimates. This is not a trying to prove out a concept. Removing dams, and I don't want to overstate this, but yeah, we kind of know what we're doing. And we've got the expertise. It, we've done the proof of concept, and now we're talking about scaling it. Just to add to that, Tom, I mean, uh, again, Fish and Wildlife Service, we don't explicitly look at economic cost benefits. Um, the glib answer to your question is just the way we monitor sort of stream miles and acres of habitat through our biologists. We, are, we also have a couple of smart economists on staff who can help us figure out sort of what the cost benefit returns are. Um, I, I do think there's a bigger opportunity, especially as this problem scales up and, and, and we're able to uh, tackle it at the way we want to, uh, thinking more holistically about what's the most effective way to monitor metrics that in the past we haven't necessarily monitored as closely as stream miles of acres of habitat. And um, are there ways of quantifying community benefits and climate benefits um, that um, are a little more fine-grained than what we currently have? Um, we are working um, right now with sort of folks at the USGS, the, the science survey, to start thinking about that. We are putting together sort of teams of people who can think about that better. But as Tom really said, this isn't something that's new that requires sort of showing necessarily. We know that it works and it's the right thing to do for the most part. So I can speak a little bit about the biological monitoring after some of our projects. Um, just to, we do know that the that it, these projects work, but you do need to prove those things. So we've done quite a bit of uh, post monitoring. Um, we've done a lot of pit tag work. We're actually tagging fish. Uh, we know from run, one project that uh, with the fish ladders in place, we were passing about 25% of the fish through uh, that structure. With it removed, we were up to 96% passage, and we can prove that. Uh, the other thing that we're currently working on is we have a live stream underwater camera that counts all the fish uh, using AI technology that go through. Uh, that stream system so we can count how many fish actually go up into that stream now that those dams have been removed. So we have some really good uh, techniques to prove the success of these um, projects on a biological sense, especially when it comes to fisheries anyway. I'll, I'll lean in for a moment on the last part of your question about particularly in controversial projects. Um, when we've got half a million dams in this country, they were all built for a reason. But as we've talked about today, that reason may no longer exist. The mill has you know, been gone for 100 years. Um, my observation is that the controversial projects are where there's a debate about whether it's still serving a useful purpose. Um, and there, I think, the valuation is really, really hard. Because um, you, you might be able to quantify what is the cost of removing the dam. And you may be able to figure out, OK, how much are those fisheries worth afterwards? But the dam was probably there for multiple purposes. Most dams were. So you've got the value of the flood control and the irrigation and the navigation and all of those other things that don't really get monetized very well. Um, and then there's the cultural value of 
of you know, free-flowing rivers, which also is, is critically important, but not valued very well. So I think there's a, a limitation to how much we can rely on valuing for what really is a um, uh, competing, competing priorities. All right, thank you all for your questions. Um, we are going to start wrapping it up, so thank you for your answers. Um, as we do, I'd like to introduce our final speaker, um, Avi Garbo, who's going to wrap us up with some closing observations and remarks. Um, Avi is the president of the Resources Legacy Fund that actually helped make this possible. Um, he designs, directs, and implements environmental initiatives that advance a just and resilient future for people and nature. He's also president of RLF-affiliated organizations, such as Fund for a Better Future and the Shared Ascent Fund. Prior to RLF, Avi um, was most recently serving as Patagonia's environmental advocate. And over the course of many decades of public service, Avi has served as the senior counsel to the EPA administration or EPA administrator in the Biden administration and as the Senate confirmed general counsel at the EPA in the Obama administration. So Avi has helped lead diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts across several administrations, including significant advancements in honoring tribal treaty rights and in federal environmental regulations. And we're grateful to have you up here to help close us out today, Avi. Thank you. Thanks, Katie, and, and thanks to everybody for being here. I'll, I'll be brief. I know I'm kind of wrapping up for the day. Um, extraordinary panel. Um, really uh, appreciate the comments. Uh, as Tom knows, Tom and I kind of co-sponsored a uh, symposium on dam removal the last day and a half, so I had the pleasure of meeting some of these folks here, some of the experts in the room. And among the things that were certainly our takeaway, I think, from the last day and a half, I would hope they're uh, our takeaway as well from this panel, uh, is the power of partnership. It's really one of the themes, I think, that, that ties a lot of this together. And when, when you think about dam removal, and specifically think about, uh, uh, you know, certainly Malcolm's uh, kind of comment about the non-controversial ones, and we think about the obsolescence of uh, the most target-rich environment of tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dams uh, for which there is no remaining useful purpose, um, it, it brings to bear the notion that every dam removal, certainly focusing on those categories of dams, uh, the ones that have happened and the ones that still are to happen will be because there's been agreement amongst an extraordinarily wide range of people. And I think, you know, for many of us uh, in this room, um, we don't often have the privilege of working in an area where there is, uh, as I said, such a target-rich environment for widespread agreement. Um, stakeholder engagement, I always think of, and I know you all do as part of the process, but particularly when we're talking about these sorts of dam removal processes, it's stakeholder agreement that ends up being the predicate for action and outcome. And it's also, you know, uh, the reference to Tip O'Neill, I, I, I too uh, remember Speaker O'Neill, uh, and, you know, the notion that all politics is, is local. Um, certainly all dam removal is local. And when we talk about agreement, uh, although we've got the federal family uh, represented here, it is the stories of ranchers and the stories of community members in water districts um, and, and tribes, uh, et cetera, uh, probably in every state in this country that ends up uh, being the kind of the clarion call in the book that we're writing on dam removal. The other thing that, that was pointed out here in spades is the significance of the infrastructure funding. And so uh, certainly on behalf of my organization, uh, which runs the Open Rivers Fund, does a lot of dam removal in partnership with American Rivers and others, um, I just want to make sure to thank some folks in the room who had any hand whatsoever uh, in that uh, really impactful legislation. So thank you for that. And it works so well in part because we already had, thanks to the work of folks uh, in this room and elsewhere, a pipeline of truly viable projects. And Tom said, you know, we've kind of got a proof of concept here. We actually know how to do this. And the ability to leverage those dollars uh, in that infrastructure law uh, with that pipeline and the expertise uh, that we had um, it, it has uh, made these successes, I think, uh, uh, kind of more demonstrated. But we all know uh, much more to be done. We've seen some of the maps up here. 
uh, that, that show not just where uh, the, the dots on the map are, and at probably every district in this country where there is a dam, uh, and even if you kind of pare back and look at just obsolete dams, um, there is a lot to be done. And so I would uh, suggest that, you know, again, using the expertise we've got here, uh, no doubt continued funding uh, is going to be important. Continued funding for a wide range of activities, including those on the front end, the project identification, the project design, the project development, um, those are incredibly important. And I'm going to end, I guess, just with, a, with an observation. I know uh, Shiva from the Fish and Wildlife Service talked about the interagency task force. And we talk a lot about transformational uh, uh, kind of projects. You know, in many ways, you think about these as the, the large interstate uh, projects that are either happening or to happen or um, you know, the kind of big dam deals that were talked about earlier. But in many instances, we need to realize that every dam removal is transformational for that rivershed, for the community uh, where it takes place, uh, for the property owners, and for, uh, for generations to come. Um, and, and I dare say you're just thinking about the notion of, of dams that have been in place since the 17th century. Um, you know, let's hope that we have uh, the fortitude and the wherewithal to make sure that uh, we're not, uh, we're not uh, wasting time, I, I think, and, and let's make sure that we bring to bear the expertise uh, and the opportunities of, uh, of agreement to get these things done. So I'll turn it back to you. Thank you for having this briefing in the first instance, and uh, appreciate everybody's participation. Sorry for running a few minutes over, but I think that was absolutely well worth it. And thanks again for everyone uh, in the room for their questions. And sorry we didn't get to all the questions online or really any of the questions online, but uh, we'll certainly take a look at those. Um, I'm going to put this up. Uh, this is a, a link to a survey. Um, we always uh, have this at our briefings. If anyone in our online audience or in here in person would be willing to take the survey, it takes about two-ish minutes, probably less. Uh, but it means a lot to us, and uh, we read every response. And if you have any problems with the live cast or the audio wasn't right or anything like that, we'd really appreciate the feedback. Uh, thank you to a tremendous panel today, uh, Tom, Malcolm, Kaya, Shiva, David. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. I think they deserve one last round of applause. Um, Really, really big thanks to Representative Custer uh, for joining us earlier uh, today and, and talking a little bit about her, uh, her leadership on this issue. Uh, That's really great. Also, thanks for help with room. It's no, no little thing to get a room on Capitol Hill to do a briefing like this. And Representative Custer's staff uh, was really, really helpful to that process. Um, we've mentioned, I've mentioned a bunch of times that this briefing is brought to you today in partnership with American Rivers. Uh, thank you, Tom, for um, uh, allowing us to work together. And I'd like to call out uh, Katie for being a great uh, Q&A moderator, uh, but also a great um, uh, person to work with as we develop the briefing. And sitting right behind Katie, trying to hide is Brian. Uh, thanks so much uh, also. Uh, and Avi, thank you for joining us and sharing um, your thoughts as well. Um, I, despite what it appears, I don't do hardly anything for these briefings. I have a great team of people around me who do. Thanks to Dan O'Brien, Omri, Allison, Aaron, Anna, Molly, and Nicole for all their hard work. We're also joined today by Kylie. Kylie, this is Kylie's one of our, our spring interns. This is her last briefing of her time with us. So thank you, Kylie, for everything that you've done. Uh, you've been a great member of the team. We don't have Megan uh, because yesterday was her last day, and we don't have Emily because she doesn't usually work on Friday, Wednesdays. Um, but they've also been great interns. And um, uh, unfortunately can't be with us today. Uh, everyone in the live cast, everyone who enjoyed the AV, thanks to Troy, our videographer, for helping us do that as well. Um, we will be back on the Hill on May 23rd with a briefing called Cities Leading the Way on Nature-Based Solutions. That was one uh, that you definitely will not want to miss. Also, save the date, July 30th, for the uh, Congressional Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Expo Policy Forum and Reception. That will be a lot of fun. We'll see what we can do, and maybe we'll get transformational fish passage to play uh, at the reception. We'll see. I'll talk to Shannon about that. Maybe we can pull something together. Uh, that is a great event. Uh, one last plug for Climate Change Solutions, our biweekly newsletter. Uh, I encourage you all to um, sign up for that and keep up with everything that we're up to. Sorry again for a few minutes over, but thank you uh, for joining us today in person, and thanks to a really great crowd online as well. 
I hope you have a great rest of your Wednesday. It is gorgeous out. I can't wait to go back outdoors because it's really cold under the air conditioner over here in the corner. So thanks again, everyone. And uh, we'll, we'll be back again soon.